filming already. I'm filming, mate. He's always filming. Yeah, it's Justin, Justin, my. Uh, <laughs> I was, I'm already complaining about this. Uh, but listen, who would have thought, right? Years ago, I lived in actually lived near Richmond, Kingston, where we are, and I used to see loads of cyclists every Sunday in full kit. I would be like, "What are they doing? They look ridiculous." And now look at me, I'm one of them. So I've, 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 I've become one of those people that I used to moan about in my 20s. <laughs> Hello, guys. Welcome back to another video. Today, I mean, as you can already tell in my, um, my full kit, uh, we are doing a bike fit today. We, I say we, me, myself. And I've got the man Francis here as well, who's helping me. And of course, uh, the busy man over there, we're just gonna let him um, get, talk to him in a bit. He's busy. Um, I am going to have a bike fit because I have taken up cycling. So a lot of you know this, I've mentioned this before. I'm taking up cycling and um, I had a few issues with my bog standard bike that I had. So I decided, you know what, I am going to take up get a bike fit, which a lot of people did suggest, but had no idea that there was such a thing, which if you think about it, makes sense. If you want to start a new sport, you get a professional to kind of help you and guide you. Same with bodybuilding, same with CrossFit, same with running, so why not the bike? And I think a lot of us probably don't think about this. So that's what this video is about today, is giving you guys an insight, especially if you are a big lump like myself, and you need uh, some guides and tips on ideally what your bike should feel like and fit, uh, this is probably a great video for you to learn. And I love doing these with people who know their stuff like I did with the running, the bouldering. So this will be uh, quite fun, right? Try and watch my language for today for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's always gonna be fun. Yeah. Education, I think. Yeah. Uh, so we'll, we'll get cracking, shall we? Yes, awesome, let's do it. So, this is an inseam tool, when you press it down, it comes up very slowly, so it shan't be an injury. Mm -hmm. I like to press down, step over them, with the feet hip width apart, like the bubble puts in two black lines. Okay. <laughs> Here? Yep, you got it. Perfect, thank you. It's got to clear those quads. Uh, 91.8, lovely, thank you. Yep. Uh, stand here for me, facing me. So, okay, I'm going to do a bit of a standing evaluation next, which I'd like to talk through rather than idly staring. You make you feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. We start with the feet, which is where a lot of problems in, in my foot tend to stem from. Uh, you have what's called a pes planus foot, low arch, low instep. Yeah. Usually, rather harshly, I feel referred to as a flat foot. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a mild to moderate amount of pronation occurring in both of them, mm -hmm. which is a dirty word in running, although it's a natural occurrence. Yeah. The first, the way in which the ankle joint rolls in towards the centre line of the body. It's noticeably more pronounced on the left than yeah, it is in the right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that arch is, is very much very lower flat. in the left than it is in the right. Yeah. Uh, so that's something we might need to consider moving on to the bike. Uh, moving up to the knees. And we've got masses of quad bulk there. A bit more, bit more VMO bulk in the right leg. Uh, other than that, it's all, it's all looking pretty good. Uh, just drop your hands by your side for me, sir. Uh, right hand slightly drops, so is your right shoulder. This is subtle, by the way, no one other than your tape is going to notice this. Okay. Yeah, that's all looking good. Right glute folds ever so slightly dropped. Can you touch your toes for me? Don't strain yourself, you can't. Very good indeed. No surprises there, eh? Right? Very nice. Right. Go. Two measurements of the foot one when you sat down, one when you stood up. This is to gauge an understanding of how the foot changes posture under load. So, right, right foot in there for me. And we've got 47. D width, 47, 36. With your foot kept in that device, can we get you a stand up for me, please? Yep. Uh, 49, B slash C, 49, 20. Cool, grab a seat. Right, so I'm normally looking for around 60 degrees in this test. Mm -hmm. There's no right or wrong, it's more to gauge an understanding of the body's limitations. <laughs> <laughs> Just relax for us, man. Yeah, it's about there. And with you, sir, we've knocked that one out of the park. That's uh, 75, very good indeed. So we're going to right. Yeah, a bit tight on this right side. Yeah. Can you feel that? Yeah, bound the back of the leg. 
Yeah, it's, it's not too bad, but nah. because of the right, it just does a lot of work. Yeah, 72. Now tuck your knees into your chest with your arms. Arms over the top, you got it. Now release the your legs, pull back under the cat. What are you measuring here, James? Leg length difference. Now if you can just sit up without using your arms for me. Sit up. You got it. Nah, there's nothing there. All right, can you roll over onto your front for me now, please? We're gonna have a quick look at the mobility of the sub Taylor complex, which is responsible for inversion and eversion of the foot. Looking at dorsal flexion, which is slightly limited, suggests some tightness on the calves. Plant flexion is pretty good. You make a good ballet dancer. <laughs> Thank you. It's the same on the left. And we're also looking at uh, forefoot angulation. Uh, usually coined in bike fitting as forefoot varus. Uh, such a thing is actually extremely uncommon. Uh, I've got a groovy little tool here we're going to use to put a number on it and 10 on the right, left rather, and 10 on the right. We're looking at internal rotation of the hip, which is, I can say, mildly reduced. External is pretty good. We're also going to see how you close down the hip angle, which is between the upper leg and the torso. We're looking at hip and glute flexion. 113, good. 120, interestingly better than that one, I'd say. Yeah. And go for a spin point. Oh, this is very uncomfortable. So, um, so what we've done is set this up to a guest position. Frankly, we're not really interested in the original position because it was uncomfortable in the first place. Uh, we're interested in the end result. So I have purposefully made the reach too long, the saddle too high, uh, which are the typical pitfalls for, for most, most of the people that we see coming through here. Uh, and as Obi has already said, he's extremely uncomfortable. You've got to understand though that a lot of bikes are poorly designed for the end user. I mean, you consider that most high-end road bikes are designed around you know 60 kilo pro athletes. You then got 110 kilo bodybuilder in front of you. This is not the same morphology. It's not the same uh, shape body. Uh, there are different needs and limitations for for someone with obese build. I'm painfully aware that these are wacky questions that you have with all the answers. If you don't know the answer, that's fine. So the first question is, how would you describe the pressure on your hands? High, medium, or uh, It's very similar, as in, I, yeah. So what tends to happen is, I tend to have to sometimes shift. Yeah. Because I feel like my body weight is almost on my hands. Right, okay. Yeah. So if you take your hands off the handlebars, you'd fall off the hand, you'd head off the handlebars, right? Yeah, so I would have, so, you know when sometimes I see cyclists pick up the bottles to drink, yeah. I find it harder, so, <laughs> I find it difficult to do because then I know that there's so much pressure and sometimes I'm having to sit up to do this Yeah. because right. of my there's so much pressure on my hands. Okay, alright. But it's a very real that's a very real problem to have, not yeah. being able to get a drink from your from your water bottle. Yeah. Alright. Uh, are you clawing with your toes inside the shoes? Uh no. Do you but I find so this is what it's interesting you ask. So I find that and I'm starting, if I'm going uphill very quickly, yeah. then I tend to really press down yeah. on, the, on my forefoot. Yeah. So I almost, my toes almost like that. Okay, yeah, but if I'm casually riding, they, I try and spread them out. Okay. So, yeah. Do you feel you're completely relaxed at this point? Yeah. Okay, good. Which muscles do you feel working in your legs? I don't expect you to know the Latin. Uh, when I, it, <sighs> I think it's a lot more quads. Yeah. And then I find that after a while my hamstrings start to, yeah. Any glutes? Glutes? No. 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 Yeah. no well, the glutes are the biggest muscle group in the body. Yes. They're your primary extensors, i.e., yeah. they're responsible for extending the leg. Mm -hmm. Most people will answer that question quads because the quads are the first muscle to enlist posturally. So if you mm -hmm. are unstable in the saddle, yeah. quads are going to over enlist. Uh, yeah, so there's quite a lot. Of, that's almost always the, the initial answer and yeah. response. Yeah. Uh, do you feel as though one leg works harder than the other? Definitely. Ignoring you, what you know about any power data? Yeah. From what you feel right now, you feel mm -hmm. as though one leg works harder? Yeah, right side. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Thinking about the saddle, mm -hmm. 
Are there two distinct pressure points at the back of the saddle? No, it's always closer to the front. All closer to the front? Yeah. Do you feel as though you're engaged one side of the saddle more than the other? Side? Right side. So I find that I'm almost always slightly leaning on the side, on yeah. the right. Would you describe the saddle as comfortable? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty <laughs> damning. <laughs> Okay, fine. Main of the three contact, this is potentially a, t a trickier question to answer. Mm -hmm. Of the three contact points, the hands, the saddle, and the feet, which are you the most aware of? Hands. Yeah. After a while, and then saddle. Yeah. Alright, Jack. Yeah. So, my attitude to this is very simple. Yeah. It's about the removal of your need to compensate for your interaction with the bike. An example of compensation in this case might be pointing the toes to the bottom of the stroke because the saddle's too high. Right? Yes. Another really good example of compensation in this case is also what's going on with the hands. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, if we start off with saddle height, I would normally expect between, and this doesn't mean to say people don't leave hair outside of that range, because they mm -hmm. do, but I normally expect between 138 and 142 degrees of extension with a flat foot through the bottom of the stroke. Now, we've got over 145 degrees with a heavily plantar flexed foot. So the plantar flexion angle I'd normally expect to be, to be between 8 and 12. In this case, it looks like over 20, 25 maybe. I think in real person talk, that means pointing your toes. Right, so okay. <laughs> what I'm suggesting is occurring here, in fact, I'm not suggesting, it's fact. You're reaching over extension of the leg and you're having to point the toe in order to scrape through the bottom of the stroke. This is why you get lower back pain when you're cycling uh, up a hill. Okay. Because when you, and this has led to the belief that you need to strengthen musculature in your lower back to climb up a mountain. Um, basically what happens when you, when the front of the bicycle is elevated, you dorsiflex, you drop the heel. Mm -hmm. What that means is this number then increases. Does that make sense? Yes. So what you what you end up doing, what you end up doing is you, re, you overextend the leg, it pulls the pelvis over. You then overextend the other leg, pulls the pelvis over to the other side. You, so you end up with a situation where you're mobilising your lumbar spine excessively. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. This is why most people experience lower back pain when it gets worse when they go uphill. All right. You got two legs though. Biggest. Uh, blunder in bike fitting is that they measure one side. You've yeah. got two legs, we've got a measuring both. Now, so we have 145 degrees for extension in the right leg. We've got 149 degrees in the left, which begs the question, why? Why would you extend your left leg more than your right? Mm -hmm. It's probably because you sit up to the right hand side. Most yeah. people do. It's because you've already, you've already touched on it or alluded yes. to it. Yes. Most people, you're right-handed. We know this because we've asked you. Most people who are right side dominant will sit off to one side. They almost always sit off the right hand side. Uh, it's a means of sacrifice, sacrificing the left leg for the right. And this is why most saddle sores tend to occur on the left hand side. Knee pain when it occurs usually occurs on the left hand side. If you've got one hand, if one hand goes numb, it's usually the right hand. One foot goes numb, it's usually the right foot. The, the discomfort comes about in cycling uh, as a result of a poor interaction with your bike. Okay? And if you think about the fact that we've got an asymmetrical, squishy human being, then you lash it to a very symmetrical piece of apparatus like a bicycle, compensation ensues. And my approach to this has become more and more simple over the years in that it's really about softening the interaction between the rider and the bike, thus improving their ability to absorb the asymmetrical interaction. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah? Uh, referencing the, the hands here. Now, in this particular case, I suspect that uh, this has been driven by excessive reach. Mm -hmm. you, you, this is what I call positional self-selection. You put yourself in space, regardless of your interaction with the saddle, uh, with if your interaction with your equipment. Um, and as I said to uh, as I said a minute ago, it's that poor inter interaction that causes problems. Uh, so what we might do here is reduce that reach, get those handlebars a little bit closer to you. We, we want you holding those controls, and you know if you're if you're not holding the controls, it's generally an indication that something's not quite right. Yes. The controls are where we operate the gears and the brakes from. We want to, we want to be on there. They're designed for you to, to hold to hold your weight. For the viewers at home, if you're finding yourself gravitating away from the levers, it's quite often an indication that the handlebars. Too wide, in your case that's not the case, um, or the reach is too long. Because having too much pressure on the hands, um, there are handling ramifications to that. So your the, the, the bike's not going to go around corners very well. In fact, on the contrary, it's going to always want to go around corners. It's going to feel very unstable at high speed. We want your hands, and this isn't necessarily always a, um, achievable, but we want your hands to be relatively light. 
Okay. All right. Uh, frankly, in this instance, what's happening actually is that you're doing a plank and having to ride a bicycle at the same time. You're too stretched out. So, so this is a pressure map of the saddle. The numbers are micro bars, the barometric pressure, and you can see that there is twice as much pressure being driven through the left-hand side of the saddle mm -hmm. as there is on the right. Okay. Now, what that that is consistent with someone who sits off to the right-hand side, because right. what happens is as you sit off to the right, you over-engage with the left side of the saddle. All right. It's it, it, it's Counterintuitive, I know, but this is generally what I've, what I come to find. A couple of other things: we can see that there's a huge amount of pressure going through the nose. What I to give you an understanding of what I'd normally expect from this image is two roundels of pressure here and here, and nothing through the front. Uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, what we're looking to do is engage skeletal landmarks, the ischial tuberosities, sit bones. We call them sit bones for a reason because primarily we were intended to sit on them. We don't want to. We didn't evolve to sit on on our genitals on hard pieces of foam, right? So what we're going to be looking to do is to load the skeleton, and offload the soft tissue today, all right? Again, this is hugely driven by saddle height. If the saddle is too high, it becomes a penetrative entity. Mm -hmm. So your genitals essentially are braced between the saddle and the bottom of the pedal strap. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Glad that you kind of picked that up because. Um, I did wonder about that, so uh, yeah, just can't wait to fix that. Saddles get a really bad rap. Saddle discomfort does not come from saddles. Mm -hmm. It comes from bad positions. If you consider that all saddles are designed with specific intention of you sitting squarely in them, mm -hmm. if that doesn't happen, well, hell breaks loose. Now, one other thing that we, a couple of other things that we wanted to talk about were specifically for you and riders who are built like you, and actually not necessarily just muscly riders, but just bigger riders in general. Yes. I think one of the things that bigger cyclists have failed by is the fact that bicycles are designed for professional cyclists. Whether we like it or not, all the top end exa Italian exotica, it's all designed for Chris Froome to win the, win the Tour de France. With the greatest of respect, so you are not Chris Froome, right? Yeah. Yeah. And if you look at a, a typical professional cyclist, they, they're like him. They weigh 60 kilos, they're very little upper body mass. There's quite a lot of displacement going on in the knees. The knees come out at the top of the stroke, right? See that? Yeah. Slow it down That's to a quarter speed. Uh, say again? Left one even more. Yeah, well, the left one will almost always come out more if you if you sit off the right-hand side. Mm. Go back a little bit, because what essentially what happens is, as you sit off to the right-hand side, you end up doing a bit of this. Yeah. So quite often you'll brush the top tube with your right knee, left knee will go out. Mm -hmm. Bike Fitting 101 teaches you to put a wedge in that left, into that right foot to straighten the knee. All that right. does is create torsion and knee pain. Anyway, uh, so what we want to do here, this is a simple, simple stacking exercise to get the knee, uh, the foot underneath the knee, underneath the hip. Now, something that's really interesting with you, and we, off camera before you arrived, we were talking about maybe, maybe saddle width was going to be a consideration. You've got a tiny pelvis, mm -hmm. you know, so you, you're not necessarily going to want a really, really wide saddle, it's just going to get in the way. So, one of the things, again, we're going to experiment with saddles today and try and get you a bit more comfortable. Uh, and the other thing we wanted to talk about was handlebar width. I think in, in your case, you're one of the very few or very rare cases where I'm probably going to put you on a 44 centimeter handlebar. We said off camera uh, a little while ago that I can count on one hand the amount of 44 centimeter handlebars I've, I've, I've fitted over the like, in the, probably in the last five years. But uh, you know, you're very broad, so we're probably going to need a, a, a wider bar. But the, the, the fundamental is we've got to get that saddle height down, we've got to get the reach down, we're going to do a little bit of work on your shoes first of all, because that's the foundation, it's the most important bit. Yeah. And uh, then we're going to have at it and go through the rest of it. All right, so, yeah. makes sense? Okay, so this is a, a G8 2620 modular footbed. Uh, it has five different arch pieces which are also movable and adjustable so we can change the position of the arch location. Uh, what I'm going to do to use, well, we're using this to, uh, I don't really want to tell you because it's, uh, okay. uh, but I've come to the conclusion that everybody needs arch support in cycling. Okay. It helps re-establish a connection that's lost when you put your foot into a cycling shoe. If you think that a running shoe enables the foot to flex, right? Whereas a cycling shoe, ski boot, roller skate, roller blade, ice skate, whatever, um, doesn't allow natural flexion of the foot. So actually this has a similar mechanism to the barefoot running thing, even yeah. though it's a foot bed. Yeah? So I, I think ultimately we didn't, you know, we, depending on your religious beliefs, we were intended to run, jump and climb trees. We, don't, we didn't evolve the ride bicycles. Yeah. So and because your feet are relatively unstable, you've got this plainest foot, a lot of arch collapse, uh, we want to try and improve a little bit more of the stability there. Furthermore, that because that you remember we were talking about asymmetry, mm -hmm. that left foot 
Pro Nate's more, there's more arch collapse in that left foot. We want to maybe bolster the support in that left foot because it's going to, lacking any of the, any of the support, it's going to promote that asymmetry on the bike. So we're taking the cleat further back, right. stabilize your feet. You've got relatively unstable feet. Mm -hmm. um, and we've also increased your stops your feet further apart. Ah, um, what that's done is created a more comfortable saddle. Yes. Yeah, and less pressure on the hands. Uh, so it goes, goes to say, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier in that saddles get a bad rep for the discomfort and actually you can influence it quite heavily with the shift. Uh -huh. I got a level with you, that's the most pressure I've ever seen <laughs> applied to a saddle. But what we've done here is um, we have, t so when you, when you fit a saddle with a pressure relief channel, the pressure doesn't just disappear into the ether, it gets redistributed to the skeleton. So what we've got now is those two distinct sit bone yeah. pressure uh, pressure points and there's no pressure through the middle so we've offloaded that soft tissue and redistributed the skeleton mm. um, there's still a little bit of an imbalance but to be honest with you it's about five percent so actually that it, it's a dramatic improvement from yeah. from, from the 50 percent difference that it was earlier on what have you changed uh quite a lot mm. so the saddle's come down a centimeter the reach has come down four centimeters the stance has increased by six mil each foot, uh, the location is different, and we've now changed the saddle as well. This is uh, an Ergon SR, it's a very popular saddle, it's a we get quite good results with, uh, which is short nose. One, one of the things we use, because you've got so much muscle bulk, we want to we want to fit you with a saddle that's going to allow you to clear the saddle's nose. It's such a huge difference. Uh, it's crazy those things that he's done, I already feel a lot more comfortable on the bike. Uh, less pressure sitting more comfortably on the seats because like I was explained before I was almost sitting towards the nose so it was very uncomfortable around the groin area so now I feel like I'm sitting back and uh yeah a boy there we go slow down now, we'll slow down now yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the biggest changes we've made have been at the feet as usual, so we've got a wide axle pedal, long axle Shimano pedal, uh, a bit of arch support in the shoes, stabilizes Obi's feet, and a bit of, bit of foot activation stuff in there as well, some heel wedging in place to reduce the pronation going on inside the shoe. Uh, so yeah, it's all it's all good really, isn't it? You know, you're able to look ahead, you have arms are, your hands are soft, Yeah. no saddle issues anymore. Yeah, it definitely feels a lot more comfortable it's uh it's crazy how i can tell the difference and um like i was saying when i get on the bike now i'm not i'm not thinking about it i know that sounds weird to say but on especially when i first went on this and my other bike i know it's a slightly the slight pressure and i'm here but now i'm kind of just like on here relaxed and I can have a conversation comfortably just sitting here, which makes a huge difference. There's a huge difference with the connection to the cleats as well, which before it was just loosey goosey. Um, yeah, the seat's so much more comfortable. It's the number one thing, it's just a huge thing. So it, it does pay to get a bike fit. I don't know why a lot of us don't think about it, um, but it, again, you know, now that I'm going to get a new bike, hopefully it will just be a nice and smooth ride on the bike and uh, can get some decent speed and not feel like I have to stop, hopefully after just an hour, you know, on the bike. And uh, yeah, now I just have to work on getting faster. I decided to hold off getting a bike first, but I so get the fit and then get a bike. So originally I was supposed to get an aero bike, which is like a sexy, fast like the ferrari of bikes it's not a good fit for me so i need like the granddad bike no i need a more uh endurance style bike because i want to do like i said 50k nice and comfortable but with, with speed and which is what this will do compared to an aero bike for myself and we can change a few things the handlebars the seats so and i already know i need to change my cleats <laughs> So that was probably the biggest lesson. It's a good thing I didn't spend a few grand on a bike that would not fit. That's something you don't want. We have, we have the conversation far too often with riders that come in here 
And the, the, it's, it's a particular problem with the bike industry in general is that you, you buy a bike and then you go and get it fitted. Mm. And to, to add to what you've just said, we have a very firm fit first, buy later policy here where you know, you, you're better off understanding the rider's needs and limitations and then buying a bike based on that rather than exactly as you say, buying a bike that looks really good and then trying to make it work which usually results in a, in a suboptimal fit and usually pain and discomfort as well. You know, what the first point of you know, considering a wider stance, you've got to look at the individual in front of you. If it's a broad individual then quite likely to need a, a wide stance. So, and you can do that by uh, adjusting the cleat. You can do it, and we've done all three of these. You can adjust the cleat uh, to push it inboard to move the foot away from the bicycle. You can use washers, and you can also use a, a long axle pedal system. Probably the best pedal system for most larger riders is, is going to be a Shimano SPDSL, or in this case, an SPDSLE, which is a long axled version of the SPDSL. On the grounds that it's, it's super stable, it's extremely durable. I think it's worth noting that Speedplay offers uh, different axle lengths. However, we've come to find problems with speed plays and bigger riders on the grounds that it's just, it isn't quite stable, it develops rock quite quickly, um, and the, just the Shimano tends to be a lot more stable and a, more, and a lot more durable. Uh, it's worth noting the look will also work relatively well. Again, it doesn't really have quite the same level of stability as the Shimano does. Uh, it does have uh, the facility to run more washers behind it, uh, but there is no long axle version in, in looks range, unfortunately. So my preference would definitely be Shimano SV SLE, which is what we've got here. Quite often with bigger riders is to optimize their, their rider center of mass by taking the saddle further back. It usually needs to be done in combination with reducing the reach at the front end. Essentially what you're doing is you're moving them backwards over the bottom bracket. What it does is it loads with the pelvis more and offloads the, the front of the bike more. This is the, we're talking about the ever-present force that is gravity. And uh, obviously with bigger riders, you've got more bulk that needs to be offloaded. I find actually you also tend to need to have uh, less handlebar drop as well to, to, to offload all of this weight. So uh, just, to, just to reiterate what we're talking about is taking the whole, the whole rider further back behind the bottom bracket. It usually needs to be carried out as a combination of take the saddle back, lower it slightly, and the same with and with the front end, bring it further back and raise it slightly. It's all about taking it from coming a little bit more like this. So you're sitting, you know, you sat a little more upright and you're loaded through the pelvis. Uh, yeah, I've learned so much. Thank you for watching. If you have any comments, leave a comment below. If you have any comments, if you have any feedback. If you have any questions, I'll direct them to the boss because I would have no idea. I'll put um, uh, James's uh, Insta and uh, Francis, I mean Francis's channel. He's got so many um, instructional videos and you can learn from it as well. And some really funny vlogs. Well, the one I'm in with anyway. But um, <laughs> uh, make sure you like and subscribe. That would be awesome. Thank you so much for watching. Link down below. I don't, I never know where I'm going with the subscribe link. So just press something. <laughs> Say goodbye, everyone. Say goodbye, James. Bye. Bye. Thanks for watching. Cheers, mate.